Hey guys, good morning. Welcome back. We are touching base again with the 27D. Uh, we made a little progress off of camera, but it's nothing that is um, complicating. It's very simple stuff, so I can do a quick recap on what we did. And uh, I also have some explaining to do. <laughs> so, we went to Roll Log. You guys saw that video. It was a good time. We went Monday. Uh, Mondays are not the ideal day to go because yes the show is open but monday is usually the day everybody starts packing up early and making their way out so we did get to see a lot of stuff i got as much video as i could um but i want to explain about the shows this year and why there's been a lack of videos or a lack of video content regarding the shows um i'm just going to keep it brief i want my daughter and I to enjoy the experience and sometimes carrying a camera around and filming everything and stopping and filming and stopping and filming takes away from the experience for her and I don't want that. I want her to have as, as positive as an experience as she can because if I make it seem like work or a job or I'm constantly telling her to wait, hold on, it's gonna make it seem not fun for her. And I don't want that. I want her to enjoy this and I want her to make it a lifelong thing. You know, in the future, if she decides that she doesn't want to, that's, that's, it is what it is. So be it, we'll find other things to do together. And you know, this might just be something I have to do on my own, but until she makes that decision right now, my focus is to have fun and enjoy it with her. And if that means not as much filming is gonna be done at the shows, then fine. Um, there are so many people out there now that are filming shows and, and doing those things that aren't with their children or aren't parents themselves. And it's not by any means a, it's not a knock on them for not having kids. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's a fantastic thing for us because it's the shows that we can't go to or maybe that we can't film as much of or, you know, just things like that that I'm grateful for the people who can and do take the time to film shows and do in-depth tours of the shows because right now my focus isn't that and I'm able to recap and, and visit those shows much like a lot of you are when I do the very same thing or when I had been doing it. Um, so that's that's the reason I haven't been bringing as much show video for you guys. Um, that that really isn't the focus of my channel anyway. The focus of my channel is taking these things apart and putting them back together. So that's just where we're at. Um, with that, we were planning on going to the Andover, South Dakota show, the James Valley Threshing show. It was their 50th anniversary show this year and it would have been really great to go and we had the vehicle packed and we were on our way out of town and wouldn't you know it. It just seems that I don't have very good luck with vehicles the last few years. <laughs> Um, got in a car accident, so we ended up having to turn around and come back uh, because while it looks minor, something, I don't know if I have a bent tie rod or something in the front end because the passenger front wheel is knocked way out of alignment and it is fighting the other, the other front wheel going down the road. So I don't want to put 500 miles on a vehicle that by the end of it, the front tires would be shot simply from they're they're tracking on the road so we ended up coming home and uh, we just got some things done around the house and just we just had a weekend with daddy and daughter so that's that's the reason we weren't able to make it to Andover um, it happens you know that's the way it goes this weekend is Albany and we will be going to Albany so 
I don't know how much video I'll be taking there. I will have my cameras with me, but I don't know how much I'll be capturing just because, like I said, the experience that I want to have is about the father-daughter relationship and enjoying the time together. So that's where that is. So let's go ahead and jump onto the D and I'll get you the update. So the first major piece you'll notice is we got the radiator on. The core is in it. Obviously, everything's assembled. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, when these radiator cores, when you get them new, they come raw. And what I mean by raw is everything's going to have a square cut corner on it. So I took my grinder and I just rounded the corners on everything just so we don't have sharp corners everywhere. I got a whole new bolt kit for it. Everything's looking good there. Essentially what I did is I just lifted it with the engine hoist. I had the um, lower radiator pipes connected on both sides to the head. That way I could just set it straight down onto the lower radiator pipes and then the upper pipe goes, uh, sets right on top here and there's two bolts, one on either side that goes into the bottom of the radiator tank. So. This way was a little bit easier because I could control, instead of having to control the distance back and the depth down, all I had to do was control the depth down. So that's uh, kind of where we're at with that. I left, I left all the bolts loose on the lower pipes um, that attach it to the head because I wanted some, some wiggle room when I got everything together. Um, one thing I will say is you will have to um, start this nut on the back side of the water pipe, the lower water pipe. You will have to start that before you completely lower the radiator down because there's not enough room between here and the stud to slide that nut underneath and get it started. So keep that in mind when you're um, assembling these is do this portion very slowly. It also gives you an opportunity to loosely install the bolts on the upper radiator pipe. So just keep that stuff in mind. Go slow and it'll work itself out. <clears throat> Next thing we did, we got the carburetor buttoned up for the D. And I know what you guys are going to say. Ken, isn't that awfully shiny for a carburetor going on an original paint style tractor? Yes, it is. But this will discolor quite quickly. It's not gonna keep this nice shine on it. Essentially, this is just glass bead blasted and then polished with a wire wheel. <clears throat> so it's not gonna look like this for long. Once you get it running and gas and oil and everything starts dripping on everything, this will discolor and the, the bronze will tarnish quite quickly when it's out in the elements at a show or something. So um, some real quick things about this carburetor. You guys did see we had to rework the entire throttle assembly, but it works beautifully now. You can't get a better, a smoother response out of the throttle than what we've got there. So we've got that done. The choke we also had to do. We had to uh, have a friend of mine weld up and line bore where the shaft goes. And then the, the stop for the choke I guess I'll call this the choke arm. The stop was wore off and this choke arm was unable to, to be stopped by it. So what we did was we center drilled it and installed a small split pin into that um, embossment on the carburetor so that we can work the choke and it, it serves as a stop. So that's good to go. Uh, what else here? We've got the original, or what was on it anyways, the original bowl drain which is kind of cool. We installed our petcocks that were reworked and they work beautifully. Um, <laughs> I'll give you guys a little, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it here, but maybe we can open these petcocks and we can actually hear some of the hissing. Yeah, it's just, the air is just coming out the plug holes, but if I were to plug this, Oh man, that's going to have a lot of compression. <laughs> so 
we'll close those up. I just put a universal filter on here that I got off the internet. Um, two inch inlet is the size, but the earlier style air cleaners for these uh, DX304 carburetors are pretty hard to come by in good shape. So I'm not really tore up about having to use this universal filter, but it's better than nothing. So that's what we're gonna use for now. Maybe next year we can find an original air cleaner. Right now it's not really in the cards for me because we have to find a replacement vehicle. So <laughs> that's an expense I wasn't planning on doing. But so we got the radiator on, we got the carburetor on. Let's move on to the next piece that we finished up. Okay, well that's not working like I wanted it to, but that's because I have to rotate the gears around to get everything to line up and shift appropriately. But I can assure you, everything works like it's supposed to. <laughs> so, we got the shifter and shift rails installed and aligned. Um, essentially, ugh, strong magnets. Essentially what you have is you have your shift quadrant or guide block here. The shift rail, shift lever rail comes through. There's a spring on the back side here. Then it goes through a, um, I guess you could call it a journal here. And there's a spring on the front. Let me walk around the side of the tractor here. Spring on the front here and then your shift fork goes on. Or your I guess it's not really a fork, it's a shifter, shift lever fork, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> technical names here, technical names. Shift lever fork goes on. Now the fork has a lower end and a higher end. The higher end goes towards the front of the tractor. Um, that's really all you need to know about that. Then the shift fork rail that the shifter fork rides on has to be centered or adjusted to the point where the gears are centered on the differential when they engage. And the way you do that is the same on almost every two cylinder tractor on the flywheel side of the tractor. There's a bolt here and behind that bolt is a, a large threaded plug. It's just a standard screwdriver slotted plug you can thread that plug out or thread it in after you remove that bolt and that will either push or or pull the shift rail left or right to align the gears with the differential itself there's also this lock bolt here with a jam nut make sure you loosen that appropriately and get that to where everything will move without binding so once you get everything adjusted where these gears down in the quadrant here, these gears have to be centered on the differential. You don't want them too far one way or too far the other way because then you're not getting uh, good contact on the gears. Once that's done, you can finalize your shift forks. Um, it goes the detent, then the detent spring, and then these shift fork tubes are drilled two different ways. So the first hole that goes forward and back is for your cotter pins. And then you have another hole that goes perpendicular. That is for safety wire. So if for whatever reason the cotter pin breaks or flies out, goes missing, the safety wire will keep the detent and the spring in place and it won't go flying off into the transmission and get between your gearing. So that's how we do the differential, or uh, I'm sorry, the the shifting forks and shift lever install. It's real simple. So, about the only other thing I could tell you is on the back side of, I don't, this magnet's gonna stick to everything. But on the back side here, you guys can see maybe there's a cotter pin that goes through the actual shifter lever. That's to hold the spring in place to keep it from falling back on the lever. 
and those two springs, see if I can do this without getting it stuck to something, those two springs forward and back of that separating wall inside the rear case, that's what centers that shift lever to keep it in a neutral position. So that's how we do that. So what's next for the D? Well, we have to finish installing the new toolbox on the crankcase cover. Once that's done, we can cover that up or dump some oil in it, cover that up, check for leaks. Uh, we can put the rear plug in the um, rear end. We can fill that up with oil, check for leaks. We have to get the magneto bracket installed with the magneto and the throttle lever cross arm that goes from the magneto bracket over across and goes through this embossment on the governor case, which I found an incredible amount of wear in. So I actually had to drill this out. I built up the end of the shaft here that was really wore. I built that up with weld and turned it smooth. So now I just have to install a bushing here and fit the bushing to this shaft, which will go like this across here and connect to the throttle lever, just like that. And then there's another lever with a spring that goes to the throttle up here. So once all that system is all ironed out, it should be right and tight and we'll have a replaceable bushing. If there's anywhere we can replace the bushing and not worry about the shaft or the governor housing. So magneto, throttle linkages, oil and covers, and then we can finish up the steering. I do want to pull the front wheels off and check the bearings in the front wheels. I know that one side is missing a felt seal cup and I have one here sitting on the counter upstairs so we can put a new seal cup in there. Probably new felts, um, bearings, not real sure. So we'll get the front wheels looked at. Still waiting on our new fuel tank to come. But once the fuel tank is here, we can set that in the hood, get the hood and fuel tank installed, make our line. And then uh, we might be ready for a test run at that point. I'm not gonna put any of the fenders or anything on it until we know that the rear end is sealed up. I just wanna make sure that those axle studs aren't gonna leak, so. That's where we're at. Uh, yeah, getting closer, starting to look like a tractor again. So that's all I've got for this update. I know we didn't do any wrenching, but hopefully I explained it well enough where you guys can, you know, figure it out from there. So yeah, getting pretty excited, but what I'm not excited about is having to find a different vehicle. So, but any, you know, stuff happens. So. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Thanks for wrenching with me. And as always, stay tuned for the next one. We'll see you guys later.